Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Len Jordan. I look after ETF distribution for ABSA Capital. Uh, thanks very much for being here today. I think uh, the storm clouds, together with the Santon traffic, probably scared a few people off. So we're really appreciative um, of you guys who did make it through, and we hope we make it worth your while in terms of what you he you'll hear tonight. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to reintroduce ABSA Capital as a, uh, as a provider of, of exchange-traded funds to you. Uh, ABSA has been a little bit quiet over the last couple of years in terms of products that we've issued as well as, uh, as, well as our marketing. We've, be, we've been a little bit quiet, but we have spent that time really refining the kind of strategies we want to offer to investors and understanding exactly what our philosophy is in terms of offering product. We don't just want to come up with product for the sake of it. Uh, we, we think it's important that there's a common thread that runs through our products, and you'll definitely see that from us going forward. Um, APSA's first listing was in 2004, so we've been in the market for about 14 years. Um, I think our, our first fund was probably our most popular fund and also the one we're most well known for, which is the, which is the new gold fund. Uh, we currently manage across all asset classes just under 30 billion rand, so that makes us a really big player uh, in that space. And we, pl we plan to roll out some new products before the end of the year, which should take our, our total um, our, our total number up to about uh, 20. Um, we, are, we do pride ourselves on being quite innovative. Um, a lot of the funds that we have issued in the South African market were first, were first in their type. So, for example, the Gold Fund and the Platinum Fund were the first commodity funds in South Africa. We, we launched the first non-market cap-weighted uh, fund, the first Sharia Fund, um, and the first multi-asset funds that give you exposure to more than one asset class at a time. And I think that's one of the strengths of being involved in an investment bank uh, rather than an asset manager, is that there really is that entrepreneurial culture uh, where they do encourage you to differentiate yourself from your competitors. Um, so that's really a snapshot of, of, of APSA. We haven't gone away. Um, we've been a little bit quiet, but, but we have been working very hard on the products that we're going to bring to you tonight. Um, just to explain, and I'm going to give a very broad, some very broad strokes in terms of the philosophy or what informed the philosophy that underpins the new products that we have. We had a look at the macro economy, or sorry, we had a look at the, the evolution of indexation in South Africa. And certainly market cap funds have become quite popular just because they are cheap relative to active managers. Uh, you know, you can buy exposure to the top 40 index now for 10 basis points, where, whereas most active managers are still charging you north of 1%. Uh, and then the performance. Um, because market cap indices give you the average performance of the market, by definition, then they outperform 50% of the of the, uh, of, the, of the active guys. And once you take costs into account, usually they outperform a lot more than 50% of the active guys. But what people don't like is that term average. And, and so they've been putting a lot of pressure on, uh, on product providers to come up with strategies that give you excess performance or performance higher than what the top 40 would give you, but, by, but still maintaining that low cost structure. So that was the, that was the brief we were given by, by investors. Give us, some, give us some alpha, but keep your costs low. And that's really given rise to what, what has been termed smart beta. Now, we don't particularly like the term smart beta. Uh, at, firstly, it sounds very American. And secondly, it sounds kind of self-congratulatory. Um, but um, so we, we, we prefer the term uh, risk premier investing. And Narina will go into a little bit more detail a little bit later around exactly what risk premier investing is. Uh, and then Mike will tell us how to use it, use it in portfolios. Now, macro factors that we considered, um, firstly, if you have a look at the, the global markets, global equity markets are at all-time highs. Um, the S&P 500 has been, has been doing really well, uh, at which, which Donald Trump's obviously been claiming credit for. Um, the South African market's also recently hit all-time highs, so, so, so is London. And that hasn't really been underpinned by massive economic growth. You know, if you speak to people about what's happening in the real economy, most people are still worried about where their income's coming from and whether they can afford their bond. And, they, and they're not pumping a lot of money into, into stock markets. So you have to ask, ask yourself where this money is coming from. And we think that a lot of it has, has got to do with the amount of money that central banks globally are, are putting into the system. There's a lot of money that's been uh, printed essentially by central banks in the US, in Europe, and in Japan. And because yields in, in bonds or, or risk-free assets are, are extremely low at the moment, people are searching for yield wherever they can find it. And the one place that you can still find it typically is in growth assets, of which equities is one. But when you've got that amount of money flowing into markets, people start to question uh, whether they are valuing the assets correctly. And I think that's what we're starting to see now. People are, are, the markets are getting to levels where people are starting to become nervous about valuations. 
And because of that, we think that now is a very good time to start speaking about risk management. We think it's always a good time to consider risk management when you're, when you're investing, but we think that we'll find an audience right now, and it, it was fortuitous uh, as much as anything else that our products are coming to the market now, but it really is a good time to start speaking about how to apply some risk management in your portfolio rather than just chasing the highest return all the time. So what we did to illustrate uh, the, the asymmetric return of, of, of assets is we, um, we, we, we plotted a graph that assumes a certain loss in a portfolio, and then we calculated what your return, your required return would be to get you to a break-even position. So if you lost 10% of your portfolio, let's say you woke up one morning and America had, 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 had a bit of a hiccup, so the African market dropped 10% that day, you would need to make 11% from your portfolio going forward just to break even. If you increase that loss to 25%, you would need then for your portfolio to return 33%. And if your portfolio returned 33% from its low, you would break even. Push that up to 40%. Now suddenly your portfolio needs to do 66% return. And then the one that was probably the easiest to calculate was if you lose 50% in a day or over a period of time, your portfolio then has to return 100% just to, just to get back to your starting position. So we think what this illustrates quite nicely is that it's as important to minimize your losses as it is to chase the highest returns. If, if the market does drop 25% and, ret and, and go up 33%, if your portfolio was structured in such a way that you only lost 10%, you would share in that 33% as a profit rather than just getting to back to a break-even position. So we think that risk management is a very valuable tool to start applying in, in, in investment portfolios. Um, and that's what Narina will, will go into a little bit later in terms of exactly how we do it. Now, one of the risks that is spoken about quite a lot in the market when it comes to our indices is concentration risk. Um, I think it's very widely understood that NUSPAS has a, a very large position in our index. And in fact, I think the, the commonly thrown around uh, a number is about eight stocks typically drive the performance of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Now, if we have a look at uh, international markets, the S&P 500, if you add the, the market cap of the top 10 companies together, that equates to 20% of the market cap of the entire index. The Euro stocks 50, uh, that comes at, out at 37%, so you add the top 10 stocks together. Just to point out, in the S&P 500, it's actually a very even break breakdown amongst those 10 as well. The biggest weighting in the S&P 500 is 2.5%. And then the FTSE 100 was actually probably a little bit higher than I expected it to be. Uh, that's 43% is, is the top 10 stocks represent 43% of the total market cap of the FTSE 100. We did a little exercise to see what South Africa is. South Africa's top 10 holdings make up 65% of the market. So that's a, that's a, massive, that's a massive position. NUSPAS on its own makes up almost, uh, almost 25%. We've got, a, we've got a graph that'll show that. Oh, sorry, there, there it is. Um, that shows it's 23% when we drew this graph, but it, but it kind of uh, oscillates around the 25% the level. And that makes it an extremely difficult index to outperform if you're not happy to take those big positions in big stocks. So an active manager typically won't take more than about a 10% position in, in, in his portfolio. If he's taking 10% in NUSPAS and NUSPAS is running, he is structurally always going to underperform the index. And this is the problem with what's been happening in South Africa is that active managers have been saying, listen, guys, the top 40 index is extremely concentrated. And what passive managers have been saying in return is, but look at the performance. And they haven't answered the question about the concentration risk. They've just changed the conversation to, to another topic. Now, it, a, a lot of people are saying this is a NUSPAS problem. <clears throat> what we did is we had a look at what the market cap of the stocks in the top 40 was going back historically, back to 2002. I just want to show you, which is the best board to use? Is this one okay? Can everyone see from that side? If you look at the back there, that's, that's, uh, that's 2002 there. You can see that Billiton and, and Anglo had massive positions in the portfolio, almost 20% each. Now, because they were highly correlated, you had about a 40% exposure to, to resources at that time. And that, you know, it came down over time. And as it was coming down, you saw the other, the other companies start to go up. You saw the Nuspasses and the SA Breweries and the Richmonts starting to have bigger impacts on the market. And what this slide demonstrates is that 
the concentration risk we have in our market is not a NASPAS issue. It's a South Africa issue, and it's probably an emerging markets issue. Most stock exchanges, most emerging market stock exchanges around the world will have exactly the same thing. And so the response has been to just cap the market caps. You know, cap, cap your market cap at 10%. Let's, let's do a, tap, a capped top 40, cap everything at 15%. But the fact of the matter is that the market cap doesn't tell you anything about the actual risk in the portfolio. The actual risk in the portfolio is what contribution to the volatility the underlying shares are having. So we said, right, let's have a look at which shares in the top 40 contribute the most to the volatility of the portfolio. As you can see, the biggest stocks in the portfolio, the ones that you would expect typically to have the most stable share price performance, are actually the most volatile shares as well. And that's the problem we think. Uh, that's the problem with our market. It's not a. It's not a market cap exposure per se. It's actually a volatility contribution problem that we that we have in South Africa. That's the that's the uh, relative contribution of each stock from a market cap perspective and a volatility perspective. You can see that while Nuspass has a 23% market cap. Uh, uh, a portion of, of the top 40 index, it contributes almost 40% of the risk. And so that, that has informed our decision now, what we, uh, our philosophy. What we've said now is that risk management, uh, because of the volatility in the market and because we're an emerging markets uh, uh, country, risk management needs to play a bigger part of our investment philosophy than it currently does. We think particularly in a country like South Africa, where the market is very concentrated, both from a market cap perspective and a volatility perspective, um, that's particularly so. But more importantly, the way to manage risk in your portfolio is not necessarily to look at the market cap. It's to actually understand what is contributing the risk in the first place and to manage that. So that really is a broad strokes, a broad strokes uh, um, uh, approach to what's informed our philosophy. Uh, I think Narina will, will dig into some of the detail a little bit a little bit more, and perhaps some of the things I've, I've spoken about uh, will make a little bit more sense after she's she's explained it in her in her uh, charming way. Thanks, Narina. Thanks, Nina. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it lined I'm up? Sure or? it'll come up. Okay. I'm sure it'll come up. Thanks for that introduction. It's lovely to see so many of you here tonight, despite the weather and the traffic problems that are outside. So thank you for being here with us. We've um, been telling the story around the country over the last week, and I must say it's been a wonderful experience to see the, the interest shown by retail investors, especially in products that are somewhat more complex and, and really sort of needs a basic understanding of ETFs, how they work, indices, just risk in investments as well. And it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. So I quite like this uh, this tracking idea that APSA has for their new ETFs, in case you didn't realize why there's all sorts of trains. But I thought my role here tonight is to talk to you about how to stop your investments from going off the rails. Because yes, we are talking tonight about managing risk in investment portfolios. And I thought a good place to start would be to just revisit the concept of what is risk? Now, you know, when you talk about risk, it can really be defined as something that deviates from the expected outcome. I guess in the case of this particular train, the expected outcome was not that it would drive off the building, but rather that it would have stayed on the rails. And you can apply this principle really in so many different aspects, not just in investments. But when there is an expectation about an outcome and it doesn't transpire, this typically is what we would, conf would refer to as risk. And risk really comes from variability. So variability says it, it performs differently or it does something different um, than what we expected it to do. And, you know, the investment industry loves using all sorts of fancy jargon and terms and so on. And certainly the one that is used mo of most often to measure risk is the one of standard deviation or volatility. But I think for you and I as ordinary investors, really, that doesn't mean all that much to us to know what the volatility of a particular investment is, because I think for most of us, the key thing is really that we don't want to lose money. So if we can find a way to tie that measure of risk being volatility to a way to avoid losing money, then I think we've got a marriage made in heaven. And, and I think that is what APSA is bringing to the table for this. So it is not enough just to be able to measure risk. 
If you want to manage risk, you've got to understand what is the source of that risk that you measure. What causes the variability? Because that might put you in a position to actually manage and control it and certainly um, reduce the risk of losing money. There's also this notion that we have that high risk necessarily means high returns. And I think it often comes from this sort of graph that says where you have low risk, you have low return. And where you have high risk, high return. But quite importantly here, do you see the, the term the higher potential return? And when you take this through to what it really means, it's that higher risk really just talks about higher range of returns. And typically we see this between our major asset classes. Cash has got the lowest sort of variation in terms of range of returns, lowest risk and therefore the lowest range of returns, bonds somewhat more, and then as we move up with equities, the highest range of possible returns. Now, what's quite interesting is that this idea of high risk, high return, and therefore also low risk or low return is actually just something which applies between your different asset classes, cash, bonds, and equities. And in fact, when we start digging into it within equities, we find that actually low volatility does not necessarily mean low returns. You can have low volatility. See, this is this term that the investment industry uses that does not necessarily translate into low return. And I'm going to talk to you about why that is the case and why it actually makes for a very good measure of something that can give you high returns as well. Now, I think when we look at investment strategies, there's this holy grail that we all would like to see transpire. The holy grail of investment portfolio returns is the convex payoff profile. Now, convex is really just a fancy word for the sort of shape that you see there on the graph. And really what this means is that you want to have maximum participation in the upside of your investments, but you want to have limited participation on the downside. So you want to enjoy the ride on the way up, but when things go bad, you certainly don't want to be on the losing end along with your investments. And the question that we're exploring tonight is, is it possible to construct investment portfolios that can look like this? And I'm going to show you some of the tools that APSA is bringing to you in terms of ETFs that will allow you to construct investment portfolios that start to resemble this holy grail, the complex payoff in your investment portfolios. So how does one go about engineering such a better payoff profile? And I'm going to talk about three different principles of managing risk and show you how you can use it yourself, but also what APSA is bringing to the table in terms of the products, the ETFs in particular, that can help you to engineer such a better payoff profile over the long term. <clears throat> The first one is all about that classic criticism that active investors have about passive or index tracking investments. And it really goes about the fact that by participating or having passive exposures to market cap weighting, you are participating fully, not only in the upside, but more importantly on the downside. And this has always been the criticism of passive investment, of index tracking investments. But it really is because it only focuses on a single risk premium, a risk factor, which is the size of investments. And when you then start introducing alternative factors or so-called risk premium investing, which I'm going to talk to you about, you'll see that that is the way to actually address a very valid criticism around index-based and passive investments. The second thing to look at is exactly that concentration risk that Lynn was talking about. The concentration, not just in terms of the size or the weight concentration in our market, but very much also the risk concentration. And I'm going to share with you some insights in ERC, Equal Risk Contribution, a methodology that APSA has introduced into these new ETFs. And I'll show you how effective that is actually in reducing that massive con um, concentration risk that we have in our market. Because the problem really is that that type of risk, the concentration risk, is not only just a risk that you don't want. It's not just an unwanted risk. It is an unrewarded risk. So having more of that type of risk in your portfolio doesn't add anything to more returns in your portfolio. So if we can control the unwanted and unrewarded risks in our portfolio, it puts us in a better position to actually get closer to that ideal payoff profile in investments. 
And then the last one I'm going to talk to you about is really about explicitly focusing on that drawdown risk, avoiding that risk of losing too much money, and how one can actually do shaping that final payoff profile quite explicitly. And we're going to talk about the introduction of target volatility in investments. So those are my three topics for you tonight. So let's start with the idea of risk factors versus risk premia. So risk factors are something that within investments, we know that there are many risk factors that are existing in ex investments. Things like interest rates, things like currencies, industry-specific risk, commodity price risk, those sort of things. But the definition of a risk factor is one that over time, it is really a zero-sum game. So there will be times that the risk factor will give you very good or excess performance, and there will be time that it will give you negative performance. But on average, over time, it's just a zero-sum game. So this is not really something that you want to, over the long term, consciously expose your portfolio to, because there's no additional return to be had from being exposed to those type of risks in your portfolio. Risk premia, however, on the other side, is something quite different. Here we are talking about risk factors that actually have got a long-term above average return. So we look at things like the equity bond risk premium or the equity risk premium, the outperformance of equities versus bonds over the long term. We look at concepts such as value, value investing, small cap investing. These are concepts that we know that over the long term, it generates excess return in other words, above average returns over an ordinary market portfolio. And this is what we mean when we talk about risk premia. We want to focus on those factors that actually over the long term can give you that excess return relative to the market. So let's look at three different specific risk premia that APSA is offering to us in ETF form. The first one is the value factor index. Now, value really is, is a concept that is interpreted differently by many different people. So let's share with you the, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, the index methodology of the value factor index. Starts with the top 60 JSE shares. So here we are dealing with the large, very liquid stocks on the JSE. So you're necessarily already starting with a universe that really gives you the best of the best on the JSE. From this, you then calculate, well, sorry, not you, APSA does it for you and VITS does it for you, but what is calculated is two different value metrics. The one being book to price or price to book value, and the other one, the EP ratio, which is just the inverse of the PE ratio. So these two ratios are calculated for each of the top 60 stocks on the JC, and those two scores are then added together. And the process that is followed is to select the 30 shares out of that starting universe of 60 with the lowest combined scores. So the stocks that actually represent the best value investing from the perspective of the price of the share relative to its book value or the price of the share relative to its earnings that it generates. But that's not where the process stops. Because we're now so aware of this issue of the concentration risk, once you've selected those 30 shares in the portfolio, you still have to weight them in some way. <clears throat> Traditionally, one would have used either market cap weighting or many factor-based investments based, based the value or the, the weight on the factor itself. But in these cases, we use ERC, that equity risk, um, equal risk contribution, or also called risk parity weighting. And that really just means, I'm going to talk a bit about it a little bit later, but really it is a, it's a methodology that ensures that each individual share contributes an equal component to the overall risk of the portfolio. Remember how Lynn was showing us that NASPERS contributes 40% of the risk in the all-share index? And what you find here is that you're going to be reducing the weight of the specific constituents that are very risky, and you're going to be increasing the weights of the ones that have got lower risk, thereby resulting in equal risk contribution. And this process is repeated twice a year. So twice a year, the index is re-evaluated, it is rebalanced, the new scores are calculated, and this will be an index, therefore, that will be rebalanced twice a year, and by having an ETF that just follows that index, it means that you have now an investment that gives you exposure to what always represents the low value, the best value shares out of the top 60 on the JSE.
So how is this factor performed over time? So the black line that you see here is the top 40 index over time since 2004. So there's our 2008 crash that we saw in the market. Nice strong bull market up until then, not much happening there and some good legs to the market in recent times. The red line is the performance of the value index over the same time period. And the gray bars that use the shaded areas show you the relative performance of value factor, the value risk premium, relative to the overall market as measured by the top 40 index. So how you can interpret this is that during times when this line slopes down, it means that value is underperforming top 40. This is typically what you find during a period of a strong run-up in the market that now suddenly value invests in stocks that are not on the run and you get that negative slope. But look at that massive relative outperformance then during the time after the crash when you get the recovery coming through because the low value stocks are picked up on the cheap and then run very hard. But really since 2012, Value has not been an investment style that's been very good in the South African market. We also see evidence of that in many of our actively managed funds who specifically follow a value strategy. You know who some of those are. This is no different. Here you are just capturing that same methodology, that same investment strategy in index form, in ETF form, and therefore in a much lower cost version of exactly the same. So that's the value premium. The next one we're going to look at is low volatility. So in the case of the low volatility, once again, the process starts with the top 60 shares listed on the JSE. And to measure volatility, really the standard, it's measured in two ways. The one is standard deviation, which really measures the absolute volatility of a share. So how often and how much does its own share price go up and down? How variable is it? The second metric is beta, and beta measures the relative volatility of a share. So that looks at it and see how volatile is this relative to the overall market. And those two metrics equally weighted, put together, and out of that ranking of those with the lowest volatility combined scores, the index is selected and based on 20 shares out of the top 60. Once again, the methodology of equal risk contribution is applied, risk parity weighting to ensure that not one of these shares contribute more to the overall risk of the portfolio than any other. And this process is rebalanced quarterly. So volatility is something which is measured four times a year. Index is rebalanced and reconstituted on a quarterly basis. And of course, the ETF, therefore, will also be updated to reflect those latest index scores. How did low volatility perform? Well, interestingly enough, the same top 40 index. And now when we look at the performance of low volatility, do you see during this period of the market crash in 2008, a very short and brief period of time that low volatility underperformed and not by a lot. And once the market crashes, that's actually where you see the value of low volatility really starting to come through, where you get much stronger, much quicker performance coming from low volatility as an investment metric. And a great way to really capture the lowest volatility, giving you not low returns, Look at those returns of the low volatility um, factor in the market. The last one that I'm going to talk about is the momentum factor. Now, this is an, an index and ETF that already exists in the market. So the, the New Funds Equity Momentum ETF has been around for, for quite a while, using this particular index for about the last 18 months. But we thought it worthwhile to just look at this one also in the context of the other two new risk premia indices and ETFs that are coming to market. So once again, we start with the same top 60 shares and momentum is really calculated and defined purely just by price momentum. So which of the shares have got a share price that is on a roll, that is really sort of um, rising faster than anything else? And it's measured over a one year period, but it excludes the most recent one month. And the reason why that is done is because academic studies have actually found that there's lots of noise in the most recent data. And you can get lots of false signals in terms of momentum if you take the last month into consideration as well. So it's measured over the, the 11 months um, of the 12 last months, the, the most recent month being excluded. When they've now ranked that according to the highest momentum stocks, it selects the 20 stocks with the highest momentum, again, out of the 60. And surprise, surprise, 
equal risk contribution once again. Once again, that risk parity weighting to sh ensure that no one stock actually dominates it. <clears throat> But of course, momentum is something that changes frequently, that changes all the time. <clears throat> so this is an index. <clears throat> Sorry. This is an index that is actually rebalanced on a monthly basis. Because price momentum changes so quickly, you only have to watch and see what happens on the market on a daily basis to know that momentum really is a very volatile and a very busy thing. Rebalanced monthly, so necessarily it means that both the index and the ETF that tracks that index will have a much higher level of turnover. But that's the only way that you can actually keep up with the momentum. Always be ensured that you are invested in the stocks that display the best momentum in the market really. But interestingly enough, and you'll see it later on when Mike shows you some of the, the costs associated with the product, although this one has got a much higher transaction cost inside the ETF, despite those higher costs, it still outperforms and still gives you more return than the additional costs that you incur in the portfolio. Performance-wise, well, here you can see how exceptionally strong a momentum index performs when the market is in a bull market itself. So this is a real high beta strategy. This is where the market is performing strongly, but the momentum shares outperform even the strong market. And you can see on those gray um, bars the extent to which it's built up over time and really give you that strong outperformance for the momentum factor. So what, how do we determine whether a factor is a good premium? I spoke about risk factors and I spoke about risk premia. How do we know that what we've identified as a, good, as a risk factor is also a good risk premium? And we do that by evaluating what is called anti-factors. Now, an anti-factor is really just the thing that is exactly the opposite of the factor that you are evaluating. And what I mean with that is really, let's look at some examples. In the case of volatility or variability, quite obvious, the opposite of low volatility would be high volatility. In the case of value, it would be cheap versus expensive. And in the case of momentum, those shares that are on a roll versus the ones that are absolutely going nowhere. Now, the way that you test this is to create a portfolio of the low volatility shares and a portfolio of the high volatility shares, and then you measure their performance over time. And if the factor premium, so the low volatility, for example, performs well and the opposite, the anti-factor performs poorly, it means that you've identified a good risk premium. And that's exactly what's being done here. So when I look at the performance of these different factors, you see the overall market sitting over there at a risk of around about 19% per annum, return on average of about 16% per annum. And when we now look at our low volatility risk premium, it's anti-factor, the anti-low volatility, sitting on the extreme opposite, very high risk, very poor return, indicating that volatility is a really, really strong risk premium and to use that in terms of capturing those excess returns that come as a result of that risk premium that we've identified. Value, interestingly, and I'm oh, sorry, let's first look at momentum. So in the case of momentum, those shares are all moving quite fast. So interestingly enough, not much difference between the risk of the anti-factor and the factor, but quite a big difference in terms of performance. So once again, a good factor, a good risk premium that we find in momentum. Now, the interesting one is value for me. Because when you look at value, you see that although it outperforms the anti-value, it does so at a higher risk, at a higher standard deviation. So one might look at that and you might argue and say, but maybe value is actually not such a good risk factor, such a good risk premium. But one of the big benefits of the value style and the value factor premium is the fact that what you find is that the shares that constitute the value index looks quite different than what you find in many of the others. So it is a portfolio of shares that bring very good diversification to an investment portfolio. And Mike is going to talk later on about how you combine these different things in a portfolio. And you'll see why it is so good to actually use this in addition to the two other factors or the other premier as well. 
So I said that we talked about concentration risk, and Len clearly showed you that it's not just about size. It's not just about the market cap. And just to remind us again of those two different graphs, the contribution to weight there, I find it very interesting when I contrast it directly next to the contribution to risk. Now you can really see the evidence of the much higher contributions to risk. And we were all concerned about the contribution to weight, contribution to size. But that's not really where the big risk in the market comes from, as Len has showed us. So this introduction of the equal risk contribution or the risk parity contribution is quite a difficult concept to understand. So I thought, how will I share with you what is this ERC? So I thought, well, maybe I'll just explain to you what is ABS. Do you know what ABS is? I had to go and Google, what is an anti-locking braking system? It's that. Don't you see? This is what a ABS does. This is how it works. Do you understand it? I don't. But you know what? I don't need to understand it to know what it can do for me. I know that if I hit that brake pedal that has an ABS brake system behind it, the car will come to a stop. And that's all I need to know about ABS. And I think for most of us, that's all we need to know about ERC as well. You don't need to understand the maps that sit behind it. But I think very importantly, the principle of equal risk contribution, each component brings exactly the same amount of risk to the overall portfolio. And that is really what introduces that risk management. So let's see how effective it's been. So what I've done here is to show you what the value factor in black now, what its performance has been like over time. That's just if it is weighted according to the factor, so weighted according to value. If I then apply the ERC, the equal risk contribution, that's the red line that you see. And you see there is a nice, fairly constant add-on that you get by equal risk contribution. It's also quite clear when you look at it over the, the average numbers over that period of time, not only does equal risk contribution increase the average return for you, but it reduces the risk as well as one would expect from an ERC process. And the sharp ratio, which is really your risk adjusted return, that is how much additional return am I getting for each unit of risk that I'm taking on in the portfolio. And it clearly shows you the improvement that you get by applying this ERC methodology to the value factor. What about the low volatility factor? Let's see how that one looks. A mm, little bit more disappointing. If you look at this, you see actually the RC doesn't add all that much value. And same with the numbers when we look at it. Really not that much of a difference by applying it. But I just want to take you back to the absolute returns of the value factor. Do you notice that those returns are around about 19%? Whereas the low volatility is sitting above 21%. So when you start thinking about, you realize, but the factor itself already captures low volatility. So by adding another risk metric, ERC, to it is not really making all that much difference in terms of the overall performance. So for consistency, it's good that the ERC is applied to this as well, but it's not really something that is adding a lot more. The bulk of the performance here actually comes from the low volatility factor premium. And remember how I said that low volatility doesn't mean low return? In fact, it shows you how low volatility actually is a source of very good and high returns. What about the momentum factor? Well, interestingly enough, it doesn't appear as though there's that much excess performance, but you do actually get a little bit of excess performance, especially during times of market downturn. And we're going to talk about that impact of the drawdown shortly. But you'll see when you look at the numbers over time, once again, increased return, reduced risk, and a much improved sharp ratio also for the momentum. And that's why it's so good to actually have that added ABS braking system in your factor portfolios, the ERC. <clears throat> so what I've presented to you so far are really the basis or are the new ETFs that APSA is bringing to market. One, is, one of them, the momentum one, as I say, is already in existence. The value and the low volatility currently in IPO will be listing later this month. So that's what we have on the table as it is. But APSA doesn't sleep. APSA is already looking forward to protecting the next bit of risk. Because remember, we said there's a third component that we would actually like to do for that perfect convex payoff profile. 
And that really talks about the drawdown risk. So let's see if we can find a way to do that. Because you will see in every single investment advertisement or fact sheet or whatever that you see, that past performance is no guarantee of future performance. And it's absolutely right. Look at this graph. This shows you the performance at time T and the performance at time T plus one. It's absolutely no relationship between the two. No indication what the past performance implies in terms of future performance. But let's look at the other side of the coin. And look how interesting is this. Volatility, past volatility predicts more volatility. Look at that strong positive correlation. The more risk, the more volatility you currently have in the system, the more risk is going to come in the system. So if we understand this, this is now a measurement that we can use to do something with it because volatility and drawdown, you will see, are actually mirror images of one another. So on this graph, you see the drawdown, the losses, only the losses that are incurred in the market, in the all share index. And there you see the big, the massive drawdown during the 2008 crisis that we saw, big drawdowns. But interestingly enough, when I plot the volatility on the other side, it's an, a mirror image of those drawdown losses. And interestingly enough, look what happened in the period leading up to the big crash. Volatility increased by three times. It didn't increase after the market crashed, it increased leading up to the crash. So if we can use this type of information to actually limit or restrict our exposure to those unwanted and unrewarded risks in the portfolio, we can start shaping that payoff profile. Because it is in that unrestricted exposure, allowing the market to just drift along with its passive exposures, that is where you expose yourself fully to the drawdowns in the market. So when I look at that inverse correlation, there's the graph. The higher the volatility, the sharper the drawdown. So if I use that relationship in the market and I say, I'm not prepared to tolerate more than a 20% drawdown, I can actually specify a volatility level that I don't want to go above. Because if I go above that volatility level, I'm going to lose, I have the potential of losing more money. And by really targeting different volatility levels, I can restrict the drawdown to the amount that I want. And that's the principle of target volatility. It's to say, right, let's actually limit the amount of volatility in the portfolio, and thereby we can limit the amount of drawdown in the portfolio. And how do you do this in practice? Well, this is the way that active managers say they have been doing it for a long time, and that is really to switch between equities and cash in a portfolio. So let's take this one step further and say, can we actually do this in an index tracking portfolio as well? So what I want to show you here is the gray dotted line that you see there is that unrestricted free floating volatility of the all share index. And it shows you that very high volatility during the 2008 crisis. If I was to introduce a target volatility of 13% and say, I'm not prepared to allow the volatility of my portfolio to rise above 13%, you can see that it's been very effectively engineered that way, that you don't breach that 13% target volatility. And as I say, this is done by actually switching between equities and cash. So the red is the proportion of the portfolio that is invested in shares, invested in equities, and the gray bit is the proportion of the portfolio that is invested in cash. And you can see here that in 2008, in fact, at a time, the entire portfolio would have been in cash, no equities, no shares, and there's certainly been many times where the entire portfolio would have been in equities. And it is by this switching between equities and cash that they are able to engineer that limit, that maximum target volatility in the portfolio and thereby limit the drawdown losses. And here you see that limited drawdown. If it is unconstrained, there's your very big drawdown in terms of your 20, 2008 crisis. The red line is the actual drawdowns on the portfolio based on that target volatility that has been introduced. Now, if you can do this, in an index, it means you can do an ETF that tracks that index. So all I'm going to say at this stage is 
watch this space. <laughs> That's what I have to share with you tonight. I'm going to ask Mike to come up now and talk to you about how to use these three particular risk premia ETFs in portfolios and how you can also use that, especially over the longer term, really to reduce those unwarranted and unwanted risks in your portfolio. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, uh, Narina. It's a, uh, I'm Mike Brown from ETFSA. Um, Narina is also from ETFSA. We're uh, independent providers of ETF products, and we use everybody's products, but we like EPSA's products, <laughs> which is one of the reasons we're here. And uh, I think what they're talking about tonight is something that's quite a bit different and giving us ways of managing risk and looking at certain factors, and they're promising, of course, to bring us some other stuff. So I'm going to be quite brief. I just want to talk to you about the actual ETFs that are going to be available to us as investors, and uh, those are the three. The new funds, new funds is the ABSA brand name, and these are new products, so they're new new funds, uh, value equity ETF, the low volatility ETF, and the new funds equity momentum, which has been around for about five years or so. So that, that's been around for a while. And let's just unpack those uh, a little bit as we go forward. So the first one is a value fund. As Narina was saying, you measure value by looking for low price to equity ratios or low price to book ratios. We have a whole lot of people that appear on the radio with Simon Brown who say the market's high because the P's are high or low or something. You've got to look at more than just the P's. You've got to look at price to book and other ratios. You've got to look at risk weighting. You might have a very low PE stock, but it's, it might be highly risky <laughs> for various factors in terms of volatility and elsewhere. So the products that they're doing, they're looking at a different sort of factors, searching for value, and uh, this is the NF Value Fund. Share code is there. The index is provided by ABSA themselves together with VITS. They use VITS because they've uh, got to be careful in this. They've got a database that's probably better than the JSE's database. <laughs> And so that database is very important in being able to interpret historically the sort of things that they're trying to measure. And it's the new VITS, uh, new funds VITS risk controlled SA value index. It's provided by apps and VITS as a calculators, but they also use S&P. S&P are the major provider or calculators of indices around the world, so they are independent calculators. There's a distribution here. In other words, the shares that are in this portfolio will pay dividends but they don't actually pay the dividends out to you. They, they, they reinvest those dividends automatically uh, when received at the end of every quarter. And so uh, it's what's called a total return fund, or globally what would be called a roll-up fund. Now, there's some big advantage here because when you get your dividends in your ETF, and it's to your stockbroker account, unless you tell the stockbroker to reinvest those dividends, he's not going to do anything. When he does reinvest the dividends, he's going to charge you fees to reinvest the dividends. A total return fund means that your dividends are automatically reinvested. In other words, you're capitalizing all the income. And over a long period of time, capitalizing income is a big factor in determining your total returns in portfolios. But you don't have to pay any fees for it. So total return funds are quite nice. The one thing, though, is that you are deemed, even though they've reinvested dividends and interest for you in some cases, you're deemed to receive that interest. So you get a tax at the end of the year that says you've actually received this interest, even though we've re reinvested it for you. But that's not too serious because don't forget there's a withholding tax on dividends anyway, so you won't have to pay that tax twice. So it's a total return fund. The fees is a maximum management fee of 50 basis points per annum, which for a clever fund like this, you know, we won't point out to anybody, but you know, other value managers, whoever they might be, Alan Gray's or people like that, they charge you a lot more than 50 basis points to do a, a value fund. So it's quite cost-effective. And the index gets rebalanced, as Narina said, twice a year, February and August. Don't forget most value, you're looking at the company accounts, and most companies only report twice a year. So it's really only twice a year that you're getting the data in order to, to generate the, uh, the information that enables you to set up a value fund. This is the portfolio that they're starting off with. In other words, this on the left is a sector allocation. And you'll see that the materials, resources, and uh, financials are a big portion of the portfolios. In other words, their analysis says that these, these sectors offer value. And then you've got the, the rest. You've got smaller amounts in industrials, consumer services, and property. And the top 10 holdings are there. There's 30 shares in this portfolio. Apart from Intu, which is a property company that's surely going to be absorbed by 
by Harmison's a, a UK company to make it the biggest property company on the JSC. The rest have all got quite small weightings. It's a nicely diversified portfolio looking for value, and you're getting 30 value stocks. For you to do that yourself is quite difficult. So I particularly like this, 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 this product if you're looking for value in terms of the methodology and what, what they're doing with it in terms of offering you this, this product within an ETF structure. So that's the new value one. Let's just get on to the low volatility, the NF low vol. Low volatility is where, as Narina explained, you're trying to take away your big movements against the index. I think, as Leonard said, if something goes from 100 down to 60, it takes a long time to get back to 100. But if something goes to 100 just down to 80, it gets back to 100 a lot quicker. So volatility measures your, really your, your movement against your standard deviation against the benchmark, against, uh, against the mean. And uh, the low volatility is quite a useful strategy for investment. The, uh, this, again, is developed by Absa in conjunction with the Vitz guys. So the Vitz blokes are earning some consulting fees. Uh, index provider, again, S&P does involved there. Distributions are reinvested for you automatically, so you do get distributions. So part of your return will be the reinvestment of dividends. Uh, the fees, again, they cap this at 50 basis points. It might be less than that. They'll have to see over the first year what it costs. And because volatility is something that's always around, they rebalance this every quarter. If you're looking at volatility once or twice a year, you'd have a problem. So the volatility index, it's useful to have a rebalancing on a regular basis. So again, this is structured very nicely in terms of looking at volatility as a single factor for you to look at uh, managing risk. The sector allocation there, very different portfolio <laughs> to the value portfolio. This one's now got 43% in consumer stocks. These, these don't bounce around a lot. <laughs> they don't move around. There isn't the same volatility in them that there is in perhaps other sectors. Uh, materials and resources, that's, that's quite volatile. And there's your portfolio. You'll see that your biggest holdings are in companies like AVI, Anheuser Bush, Clicks, Vodacom, uh, all consumer generated companies. And so this is a very different portfolio, just looking through it in terms of what, it's, what it offers. It's a portfolio of 20 shares. Again, there's no big concentration. There's no single company in there that's 20% of the index. So that's the equal risk contribution coming in, that you're spreading the risk amongst a number of different stocks. And so uh, this one offers you low volatility, and that's an important component of any investment strategy, particularly long-term, and we'll talk a bit about long-term as we go on. Now, the momentum one's been around for quite a while, been around for five years or so. We use it quite a lot, ETVSA. It's not used as much in the market as it perhaps should be, and really what Momentum does, and again, you've got the same index providers and all the rest, Momentum just looks at the shares that are really running. What's shooting the lights out? What are the top 20 shares effectively that are rising in absolute price returns uh, in the market at the moment? And because those price returns vary quite substantially, they look at it monthly. So the guys at Apps are working quite hard here. This is not an index that they look at once a year. They're looking at every month at momentum in the market, which are the shares that are really showing price uh, upward momentum. And, uh, and that's quite a useful tool because for you to go and capture, and this, well, I'll talk about the portfolio later, but they go and capture for you all the time the shares that are showing good price momentum. And they look at it every month. Now, there's a downside to that, as Narina said, because they're changing the portfolio every month, there's some transaction costs in there. So this product costs, instead of 50 basis points a year, it's 1,8% per annum. Normal fee you'd pay for a unit trust, but ETFs are normally cheaper than unit trusts. But despite that fee, this performs very nicely in terms of, and we'll look at the performance numbers later. later. Uh, they rebalance the index every month. There are distributions because in that portfolio of shares they run, they will be receiving dividends, and they pay those dividends out to you. But most of the dividends are absorbed in the transaction costs. So you're getting a somewhat inconsistent distribution of dividends, but you will be receiving income flows steadily in this particular product. Again, I quite like that, that process of, uh, of monthly distributions. Here's the portfolio, <coughs> top 10 holdings. Guess what's the number one? NASPES. <laughs> okay. But it's not 20, 30% of the index. It's 
9.8% of the index. That's the equal risk contribution kicking in. We're happy to buy a nice place, but we're not going to put all our money in nice place. And, of course, you've got the other ones that have been running. Uh, resilient REIT, of course, is a, uh, uh, not, doesn't look so good now. This was a January portfolio. But effectively, they're going and they're looking at capturing price momentum. They're looking at it every month. And this is a really useful ETF to have in a portfolio. But it does give you one single factor. It's giving you absolute price movements. So those are the three products. Uh, let's just summarize the methodology again. The value equity ETF looks for undervalued shares, looking at low price to book earnings ratios, low price to price to earnings, price to book, equally weighting those, so we don't have too much money just sitting in any one particular stock. The low volatility, we're looking for shares that don't show massive fluctuations. Uh, Standard deviations against the, against the index, and then absolute price momentum for the bottom one. So these are all single factor. We're looking at single investment factors, and we're capturing them in, in individual ETFs. And uh, we're only looking at the most highly liquid top 60 shares in the JSC. So those are the three products which I think all have value in managing portfolios. How would we use them? Well, let's look at the performance. And the arena, to some extent, showed this already. The black line, and we're going back now to 2004. So that helps to have a big database. And you're indexing everything at 2004 to 100. And you'll see as it goes along, the, um, the black line is the um, – uh, I'm pointing to this one here. I, I can't keep on moving both to both. Black is your, is your top 40 index. The green is the value. Everybody in South Africa chases value. But over a long period of time, value doesn't necessarily give you long-term returns. It gives you returns from time to time. As Narina said, the recovery from 2008 was good, and then we had a big recovery last 2016 in value stocks. Then we got volatility, which is despite the fact that they're looking for smoothing out fluctuations, gives you nice returns. Then, of course, momentum. <laughs> you know, when the market's in a momentum phase, it's a growth phase, and momentum is a strategy that you want. But over the period of time, as you go back in time, each of these factors adds return with lowering risk. So it's really worthwhile looking at these sort of products in long-term portfolio construction, I think, particularly for institutional investors. And people like yourselves, I mean, youngsters like Anna Forsman, I mean, they've got plenty of years to invest. So you're looking at really long-term, all the girls, plenty of time. It's the blokes that are a bit old. But you've got plenty of time to invest, in, and managing risk is always an important component to that. This is, these are just the actual returns over the last 10 years on a one-year basis. So we, that's a snapshot to the end of January every year. And you see that the longer you go along, the better your returns in each of these products. So that they actually outperform the all-share index over a 10-year period, less significantly so over five years and one year and three years. But certainly over a long period of time, factor investing with risk control makes sense. Perhaps we can show it a little bit differently. For a retail investor, which most of us are, including ETFSA, most of our clients are retail investors, instead of picking and choosing which factor you want to be in, it's not a bad idea to just equity weight. Just put a bit of money into all of them. You know, 10 grand each, or in Anna's case, a million rand each into each of these. And that then measures you. You're buying the risks then equally and you're buying the different factors equally. If you're a professional investor, then there are periods when one factor will add value, like momentum currently. And value, when the market recovers from a significant shock, like in 2008, then you often want to buy undervalued shares because they will recover quite quickly. So each of these can be considered as a single factor, but you really need to be a professional investor. Or we'll use the advice of somebody like, I don't know, ETFSA comes off the top of the mind to be able to do this for you. <clears throat> uh, so, you so there are experts in, the, in the, using these sort of indices and these products. If we now look, and this is really the final slide I want to show you, if we now equity weight, so now we've got, there's the black line is your all-share index, um, and here you've got the value, this is your diesel bucky, and then you've got your, your low volatility, which is a bit smarter, and here you've got your momentum. So this is a Porsche 911 with ABS brakes and everything. The low volatility might have that. But if you equally weight them, 
Yeah, you've got something, this yellow line, that does pretty well. So now you've got something that can go in the bush, like your bucky, but it can also give you all, this, all the mod cons, including ABS, but, you know, self-tuning radio stations and all the rest, that sort of stuff I don't have in my car. But so equity weighting, <clears throat> all of those is not a bad investment strategy. <laughs> And I think we'll see going forward, as, as Narina was hinting at, uh, products which give equal factor weighting and so on. So that's a, quite a good strategy for us all to follow uh, over a period of time. Just the final thing, um, again, emphasizing over 10 years, if you equally weight all of these three ETFs, you quite significantly, after five years, you're getting similar performance to the all share index. After 10 years, you're outperforming. <laughs> So I, I quite like the concept of long-term investment, equity weighting, retirement funds and things like that, using all of these factors, um, either all together or perhaps trying to pick and choose. But even if you use it all together, it certainly adds value. All right. So then uh, we're in an IPO at the moment. So it's initial public office. So it means you can raise uh, – absolutely busy raising money for listing this new, these new products, the value fund and the low volatility fund. You've got up until Thursday next – week to participate in the IPO. So get all of your broker or your platform, whoever you're using, and say, I want to get involved in the IPO. Then we'll talk a bit more about this uh, later. And, uh, and these products will be listed on the 26th of March. So it's, uh, so it's just around the corner. And I think this is bringing quite sophisticated products to the South African market that we'll all get to, to learn to use as time goes down. So I'd like to congratulate EPSA on, on bringing these uh, products to the market. That's all I've got to say. Um, I'm going to ask Leonard and uh, Narina to, to come up on stage so we can answer questions. And we'll also, we'll also give Leonard the chance to have the last word as the, as the EPSA man in terms of, uh, of uh, what he wants to add to that. So over to you, Leonard. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Mike. I just wanted to say, in, in case you think Mike's oversimplifying it in terms of the uh, equal risk, equal weighting in terms of uh, portfolio construction, we actually speak to quite a lot of pension funds offshore, and they follow that exact strategy, so that they look at more asset classes and more factors. But certainly, an, uh, an equal weighting um, is not oversimplifying uh, the strategy that you should be using in your portfolio. Uh, just to clarify our relationship with Vits as well, we, we do use their database, but they also do academic testing of all the theories that we have. So it's not a bunch of investment bankers looking to extract uh, uh, every cent that we can out of the out of the product. It actually has been tested quite rigorously by uh, by academics. So um, just wanted to clarify that. <laughs>